Interference. This is Dr. Ali Mugabel, and we're covering interference. There are many sources of interference. In wireless communication, we have two main types of interference the co channel interference and the adjacent channel interference. The co channel interference is interference from users and other cells operating at the same frequency. While adjacent cell interference, or adjacent channel interference, sorry, is from users within the same cell. So you have co channel and adjacent channel interference. When it comes to the impact of interference, we have three scenarios. For voice, for voice channels, interference results in crosstalk, that's the talk would interfere with each other, and the, the voice will, will cross with the other voice, and background noise. For control channels, interference results in missed or blocked calls. So you can think of higher impact. However, for the case of data, you can think of interference impacting the probability of error or resulting in another way in having less data rate. So interference in general is not th something that you want to have. It's something that you would like to reduce. Now let's look at co-channel interference and capacity. Uh, for the case of co-channel interference, remember in the cellular system, we will be repeating the same set of frequencies. So A, 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 or E, E, E will be using the same set of frequencies. We're going to assume that all base stations transmit at the same power. Once they are transmitting at the same power, then we can say that we're going to focus on the worst case. Remember that this, we're taking these two examples here, A and A, those are interfering cells. If a user is here, he will get interference from the other cell. If the user is here, he will get co-channel interference. The worst scenario is that the user is going to be away from the base station at the edge, right here. So the user is going to be located here at the edge where we have the minimum power from, from the base station and will be closer to the to the interfering station. So we can measure, we can get an idea about the co-channel re, re, reuse ratio. Remember that R is the radius of, of, of the cell and D is the distance between uh, the, the co-channel interference. So the ratio between them, D over R, is called Q, the frequency or the co-channel reuse factor. It's important in determining the amount of uh, interference. So the co-channel interference decreases with Q. As D increases, we're getting away. So you want really uh, Q to be large. For hexagonal cells, we know that um, we can relate Q to R and D by saying it's a square root of 3n. We have seen this before. I'm recalling the two, the two uh, um, formulas here so that you don't forget. That's specifically for hexagonal. So if you want to deal with interference, you might try to make n small, result in small q, and then we get high co-channel interference. Similarly, if we make small n, we will get large number of large m, that's large number of clusters, and hence we have large k, and result in high capacity. So making small n, although it has a bad impact of high signal to uh, co-channel interference, from the other side we get high capacity. So one has to trade off uh, between capacity and interference. Recall some of the relations that we had before. If you are not following up here, recall the relation between the capacity, the number of cells per cluster, number of clusters per area, k number of channels per cells, and so on. So these are redefined here for your convenience. We can define roughly, roughly, in a simple way, the signal to interference ratio as the signal divided by the interference. Recall that we used before SNR, signal to noise ratio, or SINR, which is signal to interference and noise ratio. But since here interference is more dominant than noise, we just focus in SIR, uh, on the signal to interference ratio. Green, the signal in green, the power of the signal is green, and in red, what we have is interference. So we have one 
received signal this is for the for, for, for all channel and we have lots of interference coming from all the cells i know it would be six for the case of uh, hexagons and with the uh, frequency use factor of one over seven so uh, remember that the amount of power received will be the amount of transmitted power times d divided by d0 raised to power minus n and since we are fixing the power okay and we have the same relative distance same channel uh, what remains is the distance so we can represent the received power in terms of distance so we can say in the next slide that the signal to interference ratio is nothing but r raised to power minus n and here is the sum of the distance uh, from from the interferers so where is power received where, where is power transmitted it is represented in terms of distance remember that small n is a path loss exponent and free space it's going to be two now when we're doing this we are assuming that all the interference has a distance d remember that for to be more accurate we have the if, if the user was in the middle maybe we can see we have equal distance but since the user is not really in the middle we can approximate distances and then we get more exact um, answer in our case we'll start by saying all these are just d assuming same distance d from the mobile station to all interferer b stations and considering only the first tier the first circle because there will be other interferers but with much less power because of distance so we can think of uh, the first tier i equal to six so this is going to be six times d okay but then we can d we can take the upstairs so it becomes d over r less to power n and this is going to be six remember that d over r is q which is square root of three of n in case of hexagon so this equation is for the case of capital n equal to seven and with some assumptions simplifying assumptions equal distance and all systems transmitting the same power now let's uh, let's apply the rough equation that we had for this for the sir to a draft design the question says if the minimum signal to interference ratio for acceptable operation of a cellular system is 18 db this is the minimum acceptable level find the frequency use factor assume n equal to 4 the path loss exponent equal to 4 we will start with the rough equation signal to interference ratio is um, d over r raised to the power n approximately 6 that that 6 comes from capital n equal to 7 so we kind of make some assumption in the beginning but then we we would use this rough assumption so capital small n is 4 from here SIR is 18 dB so we have to convert into linear scale this is a common mistake be careful and what remains is capital N so substituting and solve for, for, for solving for N I get the SINR here is 10 raised to the power 1.8 1, 1, 1. that's um, divided by 10 and then get it into the exponent N here is going to be uh, uh, 4 divided by 2 which is 2 and then you solve for n it turns out to be 6.5 it should be greater than 6.5 and since we have discrete values for the n number one three seven and uh, specific numbers then i'll go for n equal to seven the frequency use factor which is required in the question is one over n which is one over seven again this is rough analysis because this equation embeddedly assume there is capital n equal to seven and also we have uh, made some assumption about the distance so this is just rough design it's not perfect so the equation is once more used once you you if you start back into the equation and then a substitute for n equal to 7 you'll find that the signal to interference ratio received will be 18.65 remember that if you use exactly 6.5 you get 18 but since we have n equal 7 we'll get 18.65 db which of course um, good enough because it's more than 18 db and our criteria is fulfilled in the following slide we take it one step further so we have approximate appro we have better approximation rather than the rough design we'll have a better equation for the sir keep in your mind that recall that the hexag 
uh, for hexagonal cells q equal to square root of 3n what we did before we said that the interference will come from equal distance from all co-channel interference sources over here we look at more closely at the distances for example if you take uh, the user to be here the mobile station then we'll have six different interferers we have d and d two stations which are spaced by approximately d and then we have two stations which are more important which is because they are closer at d minus one minus r and then we have two stations which are at d plus r okay so these are the green ones because they have the minus sign and these are the red ones and these are the blue ones so instead of dividing by six i will take it one step at a time what's q is the relation between d and r now for the case of capital n equal to seven and n equal to four which is the previous example if we substitute here we'll get from this equation that q equal to 4.58 and the signal to interference switch would be 17 so it's not really 18 or 18.6 using the more accurate expression we found that that we are not really above the threshold so we have to go into higher n because our previous solution was 18.66 which is not true here because this approximation is better and so is we are less than the requirement to ensure the design guarantee the worst case i will i will need to increase the signal to interference ratio i'll take capital n to be a nine Okay, that's for the case of i equal to 3 and g equal to 0 and you will get q here if you substitute 9 and then the square root of 37 uh, 27 which is going to be 5.2 and now if you substitute back q here in this expression you will get that the signal to interference ratio would be 20 db of course you get the linear scale and then you get the db scale so now we are above 18 or above 18 so using the more accurate design criteria or expression we found that that n equal to 7 capital n equal to 7 is not good enough and we had to go into n equal to 9. remember that uh, we cannot just go for 8 because there are specific values that are acceptable for capital n to have equal distance from all interfering cells so by going from 7 to 9 the impact of the design is that we have capacity reduction by a factor of 7 over 9. we have reduced the interference improve the signal but we got 7 over 9 reduction capacity in the following slide we address the cdma systems remember that for cdma systems the cluster the cluster size is n so we don't have this kind of divisions everything is just going to be one cluster with capital n equal to one a single 1.25 megahertz channel carries at the same time simultaneously transmission of a single control channel and up to 64 voice channels all these 65 channels are transmitted at the same frequency same time but with different codes so this 1.25 megahertz will be divided into 65 channels uh, how do we avoid interference by using different codes now if you still feel that there is interference between adjacent uh, clusters which are made of one cell in some cases which are ill behaved propagation we can do kind of combination between cdma and fdma so we'll have f1 f2 planning scheme that's the nearest neighbor cells use a frequency channel that is different from the closest neighboring in particular location or direction so we'll avoid if this is one cluster with cdma the next closest one will not use the same frequency so we'll have discrimination in frequency kind of combined fdma cdma in the case of in, 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 uh, CDMA interference, we can summarize three main important points. The CCI, the co-channel interference, is coming from other users in the same cell. It does not come from another cell because the users in the same cell use the same frequency. They're just different by code. The level of interference is a function of the number of active users the more users you have you expect to have more interference because they might not be perfectly orthogonal the codes could have some correlation the coverage range is dynamic time varying as we have different users different 
active users, we get different interference, so the, the coverage and range is dynamic and time varying. Power levels and threshold have to be adjusted according to the traffic intensity. Since we have more users means more interference, we have to adjust the traffic, we have to adjust the power level and threshold accordingly. So there is some power control there which is very important. Now moving to the second type of interference, adjacent channel interference. Now adjacent channel interference or ACI results from imperfect filters which allow nearby frequencies to leak into the working passband. Look at this example. It is the channel of interest, desired channel, signal on the adjacent channel, signal on the adjacent channel. Since we cannot have perfect filters because they simply do not exist, we'll have some interference from the next channels. These are usually small, but the problem become more dominant if we have the case of near-far effect. The near-far effect is the case where due to the fact that F1 and F2 different users being near in band, they're having a similar band, they're just close in band, one signal being order of magnitude stronger than the other. Let's say, for example, this guy, because this guy is far, he's asked to increase his power. And then at the receiver side, we could get um, a strong signal here and much, much stronger signal here from, from this guy. So they could interfere together. It results in F2 capturing uh, the receiver of F1. So because this is sending with strong power and he's closed somehow to me, I'm going to get some part of the signal. Although it's in different frequency, but it's adjacent. So through filtering, it would leak in. Again, remember that co-channel interference come from different cell usually with the same frequency, but for the adjacent channel, it's adjacent frequency. It's not the same frequency. In this slide, we address the solution to adjacent channel interference. We can solve the problem by using high quality filters, but this is expensive. So there are small tricks we can do. Channels assigned to, to a cell are maximally separated. Remember that we somehow could have different frequencies at different cells, although we are using CDMA or FDMA, whatever the, whatever the technique you are, you are using. We can assign a, a band here. So if we have a chunk of frequencies, We'll not take one chunk to A and then another chunk to B and C and so on, but rather we'll take the first band to A, second one to C, A, B, C, D, and then we we'll come back. This will guarantee that all users in the same cell will be maximally separated. This is sequential assignment. And that would guarantee n-channel separation. Because if you have n cells, one channel will come here, second, third, fourth, and then seventh, and then eighth back. So they will be guaranteed n-channel separation. We can even prevent second tier interference by not assigning adjacent frequencies to adjacent cells in the second tier, but this is only feasible for large N. And of course, as the N become larger, it becomes more efficient. So to sum up, users or cells should be assigned bands that are not adjacent. We can use sequential assignment. And of course, last but not least, power control transmit with the smallest power that's necessary to maintain good quality. So just the smallest, the minimum possible required. Don't overdo it. And that would result in reduced interference and prolonged battery life. It, it's very important for the mobile stations to extend their power life. That's it about interference. Uh, if you have any question, please write your, your questions in the comment section. And we'll be discussing other important items like trunking in coming videos. So see you then. Thank you.